Well, Metaphysical has done countless shows now on ancient civilizations, strange places, creature and counters, remote viewing, and otherworldly phenomena. In the process, we have gotten a lot of fan questions, so we thought we would bring you a metaphysical Q&A where we answer your questions directly from live comments today, plus ones left on previous episodes. You want to hear more? Join Metaphysical for a show that's out of this world. Yeah, and if you're listening to the Metaphysical show on Spotify, Apple, or elsewhere, just leave us a five-star rating and review. It really, 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 really helps us. And make sure that you like, follow, and subscribe on YouTube, Rumble, Ganjing World, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. John, how you doing? Good. 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 This is- I like the Q&As. The Q&As are interesting. It's like, you know, we run through our, our, our routine in a sense, you know, for some of these shows. But then when you get the Q&A in it, like it, it, it generates more ideas for viewing. It, it just opens things up to an interesting and broader level, I think. I agree. And it feels like we're jamming like six shows into one because we cross over right. so many different subjects. And um, there are often like really, really fun topics that we end up talking about. Right, right. Yeah, we, we covered a lot of stuff on our last live. So if y'all watching right now haven't um, seen the last live we did last week, you should definitely go check that out because there's just a lot of fun stuff um, on there. Um, John, OK, let me just add before we even start, what's the weirdest thing that came across your desk this way this week? Anything cool? The weirdest thing, <laughs> the weirdest thing. Well, you and I have so much weird stuff coming across our desk. I figured it might be a fun, <laughs> fun way to start everything. Let me think. I, I mean, it's every day is a weird thing. So it's kind of like what's yeah. the weirdest of the weird as far as remote viewing goes. I don't know. I was on. Um, I was on Michael, Dr. Sala, Michael Sala's oh, show yesterday. Cool. I mean, that was cool. I like yeah. him. He's a good guy. Sure. Um, that's, I think, airing next week, next Thursday. Um, but as far as remote viewing goes, I've actually really been interested in and remote viewing around um, this guy named uh, Walson, last name of Walson. Mm-hmm. who supposedly took photographs with a, a telescope of objects in orbit that are in stationary orbit. And he like he took the photographs a long time ago and nobody else has been able to reproduce uh, what he's captured on camera. And like, you know, when you get a telescope and you're taking pictures of these objects, they're like satellite type things. They're so far away that you have no idea how the telescope is is actually treating this stuff because there's so many optical screw ups that can happen in it. And nobody's been able to recreate it, but he's really adamant about uh, they are real things out there. And he documents these sort of harassment encounters that he's getting. So I don't know if it's super weird, but I've been remote viewing and doing some remote viewing around those things that he's captured to try to find out if they're some kind of optical illusion that he's capturing or it truly is stuff. And if he is truly being harassed, he's likely like just photographing military satellites, which is... I mean, the oddest thing maybe that you just said was stationary orbit. Like those two right. words in the same sentence are bizarre together, right? Well, like, you know, there are satellites that have sort of follow a geostationary orbit situation. So you mean like it's, it's not like like locked, question. like they're, it's locked with the orbit or they yeah, just in yeah. one place while the orbit goes? Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So, so you have that kind of situation or yeah, it'll stay in one place, but I, I'm like in preliminary data that I'm getting back so far in some of this stuff is, is actually kind of fascinating. Hmm. seems to be, um, I mean, the hard part is that you're, you're going down the plat- path of remote viewing, potentially classified things that, that you, gotta like, be careful. you can talk about aliens. You can go the crazy route, even though the alien stuff is of the highest classification, you can talk about that stuff, remote view it and, and not really get gone after the moment that you step into a place where you're like talking about things that are more like, uh, let's just say mainstreamish classified stuff, um, technologies, that's where you can get like bad things happening to you. And, you know, this stuff could cross that boundary, especially if he's being harassed. It's like, well, he's mm. posting photographs of, 
of, of potential classified satellites and he's going to get, you know, messed with. Yeah. I mean, and, and it, we don't know what those are. Could it be giving away state secrets to other countries that they don't want, um, you know, declassed? That's what um, I would think. Could yeah. be a, a lot of things, you know, so right. you do, you really do have to be careful with that stuff because I mean, for him, you know, for him. Yeah. Um, yeah. You just, you know, these things are so oftentimes what we look at and we're just like, oh, this is a strange anomaly to them. It's like, oh, that's not an anomaly. <laughs> right. <laughs> not an anomaly yeah, at all. Know about that. Right? <laughs> yeah. And we've, we've, we've spent several trillion dollars developing that technology. So, you right. know, yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's super interesting. Um, yeah, I, I think for myself, just, um, I've been looking into immortality, which has been a, just a strange rabbit hole. Yeah. Looking into it, meaning researching obviously for a, uh, not, not for myself. Um, but yeah, for, for, for some shows that we're, we're going to be doing and, um, how broad, like it starts off where, you know, certain people will just, they keep mentioning the same people, but then you start finding like, no, this is everyone, every King, every mage has been searching for this throughout history. And then there are some really fascinating anomalies within that, that span different countries and different cultures and, um, different relics or supposed things that exist on planet earth that they were finding when they were exploring that we no longer look for, but that could exist. I mean, maybe why not? Um, really, really fascinating stuff. Yeah. Immortality. So, um, what is okay so actually this would be interesting what is the main component when you do your research is there one like genre or main component throughout the ages that people claim can create immortality like is there is there like a congruence of like from all over the place throughout time like one sort of singular genre or thing that creates immortality actually that would be interesting because see then we remote view that Right. Yeah. Oh, and we'll yeah. have some handles on this too, because like for right. like some things to hold on to that you're going to be able to remote view because yeah, yeah. What you find is, you know, yes, you start looking at things like these ancient things that you might have seen mentioned in movies like the Philosopher's Stone or the Elixir of Life. What's strange is not necessarily those objects. What gets really strange is when you're seeing these objects or these phrases being passed around in cultures that were separated by thousands and thousands of miles that should have no business knowing. Yeah. That's, that's the good stuff there. Uh, when you start, when you start coming across that, which I have, you start really getting into the, like the twilight zone and you're like, what is going on here? And then right, right. what you find is that things are more like, this is going to sound kind of weird, but it, things are more like star Wars out there than we actually realize. And what I mean by Maybe. Okay, uh, why are people so fascinated with Star Wars? Like, it, like obsess. Actually, a lot of people are obsessed with Star Wars, and and there and there's a lot of people out there really upset right now about what's going on with Star Wars because it looks like Disney is kind of destroying the story, right? Uh, you know, like they're 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 altering the canon, and the canon is what people like latch onto, right? Star Wars is extremely extremely closely related to the you could say the practice or the religion of Taoism, where you are cultivating a certain skill and, and that skill is mixed in with your personal cultivation until a point where you actually achieve some type of oneness with the force in that case, or the Tao in Taoism, right? And I think people like that story so much just because they there's so much truth in it already. Like Lucas, knew what he was doing he had studied other things right but you, you you find one of two things creating immortality throughout history you find either um the practice of or the search for certain relics that can imbue immortality or a person on a personal cultivation path who is potentially a hermit or hermetic not necessarily in hermeticism just in general and then they're on this internal alchemic process to transfigure their body into something that becomes right. Right. Are they, they're almost one in the same or are they, are they, or are they different paths to the same thing, you know? And then there's different, 
paths for this too. You've got like the fountain of life or the, the fountain of youth rather. You've got like the elixir of life, the holy grail, the philosopher's stone. There's like all of these things that are supposed to be out there that imbue, you know, these things. And then there could be more scientific solutions to this whole thing. I mean, they're putting tons and tons of cash into all of this right now. Right. right? So it's pretty interesting stuff. I mean, we're going to have some fun conversations at some point soon, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. We'll leave it for that. Sure. Yeah. This is a, this is a, this is a place that I'd love to go right now, but yeah, we'll leave it. <laughs> you know, we will. Let's get to some yeah. questions right now, but, um, but yeah, fun, fun start to the show already. Um, all right. Before we get into some, some questions that have just been asked right now, there's been some burning questions that people have had, uh, for a little while. And I think this is a good one to start on because this name often gets brought up. So a guy named full disclosure, uh, asked um john mentioned maria orsic can your data confirm if she was real all the info i found said there is no proof she ever even existed maria oh, orsic yeah. was okay so for background for anyone that doesn't know maria orsic was this beautiful woman that you see who people have had all kinds of different takes on she was very close to hitler in Hitler's regime during World War II. She was said to have consulted them and was said to have been a psychic whose psychic abilities actually grew in power based off of the length of her hair. I've just summed up a really kind of big uh, story in a few sentences, but you kind of get the idea here. So people have wondered whether or not this was real, it was a psyop, whatever, and John is going to kind of give us his take on that right now. Yeah, um, we we've seen an individual Maria Orsic like, but we've never looked at Maria Orsic, the person, their self. So that could be um, a different person. It could be a different name. They could have had a name name change. There is an individual that is Maria Orsic like, but I can't like, you know, bridge those two together with any confidence at all so yeah i don't know if that person did exist but i would say that there was a person maria orsic like involved in the inner circles of nazi party doing channeling psychic ufo stuff etc cetera, etc cetera. which is honestly good enough because we knew they were dabbling with that stuff like a right. name doesn't necessarily confirm anything yeah right, you know yeah i don't yeah the names names i mean yeah it could have been a concoction um, could have been, could have turned into mythology to a degree, or it could have been a psyop, right. um, in order to cover something else up, maybe, maybe, uh, that person and a group of people and to cover the other people, like you put this beautiful woman's face up front mm. and then make the legend around her. It takes the uh, focus off other individuals that were just as important or more important, you know, so hide them behind her. Well, and there's so much peripheral evidence that Hitler was into, any and all methods of acquiring power and or information. Right. right? Um, so it would be strange if he, if he didn't have some of these sort of confidential informants that were helping him along to make decisions, which ended oh, yeah. up totally failing anyway, but that's a different story altogether. Yeah. We've got this uh, whole relics of power series, which is on rise TV. If you guys want to support our work, um, this, series goes over all of these relics that Hitler was obsessed with acquiring during that time period where he was at large. Uh, it's basically like the real life story of Indiana Jones, you know, pretty fascinating stuff. Highly recommend checking that out if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Okay, here we've got some more questions here. Um, uh, okay, so maybe this is Maybe this is something that you that you can answer here. Um, uh, okay, so somebody asked, have you ever met anyone that can spontaneously remote view? Like basically they can remote view as soon as you talk to them for the first time, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I would say that most students that come into my courses will end up getting hits like the first time that they begin training. And in fact, when you begin training in remote viewing, you actually have this like higher 
uh, core ability mm. um, because you're 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 in a process where the subconscious mind is moving information to the conscious mind and right. you're in a translation process and and when you first start your your conscious mind your ego mind is totally confused it's it's breaking apart and so information flows a lot easier the moment that you begin to think you have a handle on it is when you collapse and start just going wrong as far as remote viewing data goes and that is actually where the real learning begins because you begin to learn basically what the difference is between thinking the thinking mind and what it takes to actually remote view so yeah i would say that a lot of people right out of the gate will get good hits um and yeah. remote viewing isn't like this movie playing out in your mind right it's 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 like a lot of different sensory input is impacting you totally. and you're just writing it down you're not judging it you're not creating a story you're just writing it down as it comes right so so as far as like super duper duper talented people right out of the gate i think heather heather mm -hmm. uh is one of those people absolutely Who's heather is your partner yeah uh, yeah yeah so she's absolutely um one of those people that like didn't know anything about it. Like when she first started, she just showed up at a course. She didn't know anything about remote viewing. She just heard internally guided that she should look into this and do it. And she just shows up and just starts doing it. She didn't even like, she didn't even know anything about UFOs or aliens or Whoa. anything weird. She wasn't into that stuff at all. And like, like I task the class sometimes <laughs> on that stuff only if they want to, because the best thing to task people on really, the only thing you should be doing is, is real world stuff. So you get good feedback because remaining in a feedback loop where you get good feedback is very important to the learning process. But I will throw in these like safe UFO type things. And she had remote viewed it. She's like, what am I getting? I'm getting aliens. I'm getting weird stuff. What this stuff exists. I mean, she's so yeah, she just, she really broke the mold. I think as far as I've been, experiencing um whereas people will get hits they'll be very excited about it and it's good but she would like get the whole thing the whole thing and just go with it yeah that's that's really cool yeah so um just to switch it up a little bit another question here uh from tn wild child they said is there anywhere on earth more mysterious and full of intrigue than malta in your opinion what do you think? I don't John? know what you think. <laughs> well, I have, bad, I have good news and bad news. The bad news is there's no place like Malta on Earth. The good news is every single place on planet Earth is just as weird. We just don't know. Right. And I, this is what I'm finding. Anywhere you move, anywhere you are, if you really start looking into it and you start drilling down into the weird that's going on in your particular area, you will find things you cannot explain and that rabbit hole will not stop everywhere. And Malta is just like, think about the entire earth having been previously civilized by other civilizations in history that have left things we can no longer see. And they're right below us. They're literally, you walk over them every day. Or they were there and were taken away by an organization that wanted to hide it. This is the right, earth right. that we're living on right now. And you can find this stuff everywhere. Malta is just, it's like, it's like a, the tip of an iceberg, an iceberg. Yeah. Yeah. Think, John? Yeah, I agree. I mean, oh, as far as like strangest places, I wouldn't rank Malta as that for myself because it's it's got a lot of darkness to it. Mm -hmm. And I, I like the more high strangeness atmospheres where you have multitudes of phenomena happening in one area from reports of portals, <clears throat> um, strange cryptids, uh, aerial phenomena, and just weird stuff like, like, like skinny, strange Bigfoots hopping around and screaming, wearing like baseball hats and, you know, flannel shirts i mean just i like the real how did you just sum up my dream last night <laughs> i know exactly like i like the absolutely out of place bizarre stuff like yeah. mothman was and all the strange things that happened around the initial mothman encounters you know referenced by john keel so 
th that's my go-to ultimately. And I try to find those locations. Mount Shasta's got some of them. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, what you're saying, <clears throat> what Rob's saying is that you could be walking over these things in your everyday life and, and it takes a little digging to find out. Yeah. 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 yeah and, and I would say like, there's two series that we've done that, that have probably blown our minds more than any others. And one was Mount Shasta and the other, like that whole series, there was like nine episodes in that series. And the other was the Malta series. And it was like, right. when you get into a rabbit hole in some of these places and it just doesn't stop, you could literally keep going. Malta had to be a place though, where it was like the, the most various amount of different types of phenomena were just so strange there constantly like every episode was something new and weird and you were like what else could this place possibly have to offer right yeah and this right. is the, what you're looking at right now is malta um all the strangeness around the things that were found um in, in malta underground in people's homes um in the hypogeum what the hypogeum is all kinds of just bizarre stuff it's a very strange right. place yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, a lot, a lot of the stuff, I don't know what's going on there today. This yeah. is another interest of mine. It's like, all right, well, we're looking at historical things. Um, I like to go places, right? Mm, I want current things that are going on. That's, that's like where I truly want to go. Current, look, current things going on in specific locations that I can get to. That's, that's the best, mm. especially if it's high strangeness. Now, if people were currently reporting giants seeing giants down in those catacombs current day yeah i gotta get a plane ticket i right? know <laughs> we this is a place we've got to go right like once things uh, once we're able to start going places there's obviously several places in the united states we have to go check out like kentucky really is up there for me i know that sounds weird but the hellier the hopkinsville goblins. goblin thing the, there's like the, the caves goblin. Like the cave, the cave systems that run through there have so much strange lore coming out of them. People see things all the time. They see strange footprints. I mean, this is current day stuff. Like that's that's good stuff. That's it's a place to go. It's real good stuff. Yeah. And actually right by you where you are is very strange. I mean, all kinds of phenomena up there in the in the northwest. Yeah. Um, everything from strange lights on mountains sightings in the sky of various things bat squatch which is just god you couldn't have come up with a better name for that like yeah. it's just crazy i mean it actually is pretty funny but like you know um sasquatch bat squatch like all kinds of weird what did you tell me about one time it was like some animal that has like it's a cat with the face of a, of a oh the, 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 the click a tat ape cat <laughs> Like what I don't know. That? I mean, I, honestly, I haven't found any good solid evidence of that other than like a report here and there. Um, and I think that would be really interesting because, you know, you've got this old what it, like this nuclear power plant in the area that did experiments on animals. And it just, gosh, makes you wonder. It's the area where the, the gigantic crocodiles escaped into the Columbia River. <laughs> right. Because they were like, like doing radiation experiments on yeah them. like massive out like what is this an episode of spider-man or something like, i know it's weird right this was weird. the location i can't remember the name of it <clears throat> where they supplied the nuclear materials for the first atom bomb it's like actual the story of godzilla exists in yeah. washington state and right. there's massive alligators they're not quite as big as godzilla right you know um that's just crazy and like ohio too like ohio is this weird place that like it's be it's between all these different places of strange, there's more giant mounds there than anywhere on the in the United States, I believe. Um, you've got strange melon heads. You've got sightings of like frogmen, like all, every cryptid that you can imagine. It's just Ohio is just a really, really strange place. I mean, UFO stuff there because of um, Wright Patterson Air Force Base. You know, um, it's just like. <sighs> This is what I'm saying is every time I go or I find some information in a certain specific state, it unravels into something that you just weren't expecting. Like, you know, Ohio is right. Well, certain parts of Ohio are right exactly near where the Silver Bridge collapse was, where Mothman appeared. 
you know, and then you've got Kentucky right on its border. Kentucky has all kinds of weird stuff going on, especially with those mounds and everything. It's just the whole, the whole world is just. Oh, and, that, uh, and then there's that, that crystal mine. Where's that crystal mine where they have on video crystals levitating? Where was that? I can't remember. It's like right around you somewhere. It is. I think is Arkansas, maybe it's Arkansas. Maybe that's it's down. Arkansas. It's down South a little bit more, <laughs> right. but. I mean, Serpent Mound is in Ohio too. Like, right. that's like one of the most ancient sites in the entire planet. You know, and everyone just leaves. Oh, like Serpent Mound, Serpent Mound. It's like when I went to Serpent Mound, I went there on my birthday. I was like, I got to check this thing out. My take home from that was like the entire area is was an old ancient civilization and no one's digging there. There's just like houses there and everyone's like, let's just go to Serpent Mound. And it's like, what's under what's under like the ground there, guys, right. you know? Look, it's pretty crazy. Pretty crazy stuff. Um, okay. Oh, it is. I think it is in Arkansas that. It's, what is it called? Board Camp Crystal Mine, I think it's called. Yeah. Levitating Crystals. Super bizarre. You and I talked about that on one of our shows. Right. right? Yeah, we, we had that on the show once. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, so let's go. Here's some. Here's an interesting question, and this is not something that I've heard from. This is from Why Music. Have you ever remote viewed the ancient planet Theia? T H E I A Theia. Was that 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 one would be? I think that's the yeah the one that supposedly impacted Earth. Correct. Ancient planet in the early solar system that collided with. No, Earth we didn't. We moon. didn't 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 view that because um, for one thing, it's a hypothesis that there was a planet that crashed into Earth that created the Moon. Um, when we looked at the Moon itself and its creation, we didn't view they had directly to confirm or deny, but viewing the moon would deny the Theia hypothesis mm. because man, the moon is weird. Yeah. The moon's not the moon. See also all the irregularities about the moon kind of like ditch that Theia hypothesis. And I think that a lot of mainstream scientists are like, well, yeah, this doesn't really line up. Um, so, so the moon's a spaceship. That's I mean, the, really, the when you get right down that to it, <clears throat> the, the, the thing is um, planted there artificially. Uh, our Earth has has no reason to have captured something that large, whether it crashed into us or not. Um, and um, just has so many strange anomalies about it that even NASA scientists like say that, that, that it shouldn't be there. It, things shouldn't be there at all. So, yeah. and I think a lot, a lot of people latch on to this, uh, one story, uh, from what was the remote viewers name that remote viewed it? Um, he's kind of one of the OGs of remote viewing in in Ingo Swan. Ingo. Yeah. He remote viewed it, ended up seeing something that he sh like some beings there, they saw him. And then the guy that was kind of tasking him was like, get out of there, get out of there. Yeah. Um, somebody here on our, uh, in one of our questions, Dorothy Gale said, um, I would like to know what is happening on the moon. There's got to be a way to disguise or put up a block for protection. Have remote viewers ever tried a group session and run interference for each other against the ETs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've done that. Um, one of the things about, I mean, you could, like there are structures on the moon. They can be easily remote viewed. <clears throat> it's when you get to a structure on the moon that's currently being used. There's a lot of junk up there. There's a lot of abandoned like mining operations and stuff like that. Um, and and now I, I, I believe based on remote viewing data that the center of the moon is hollow. And there's also physical evidence that uh, experiments that have been taken on to determine Lose. you know, what's in the moon. And they also determine that it's hollow in these experiments. But that kind of data gets really pushed to the side because it can't be hollow if it's a moon. Right. So so we. Um, we have done in the past where we do multiple remote viewers at the same time, kind of like the minority report precog thing where you have a bunch of remote viewers at once and you have a monitor person uh, working with the viewers as they're viewing something. And, and in those instances on the moon, when we hit a base that is actually occupied and things are going on, we will do that kind of technique. But you can get around this stuff anyway if you do quick movement exercises. We call them movement exercises in remote viewing. It's like, like 
you give yourself, or if you have a monitor, which is better, you look at something very quick, you pull back and then jump to another aspect or another location near it. And if you do that, you can kind of circle in and they might not be able to get a bead on you. For instance, these these guys that are it's very sort of like not being on the way. telephone long enough for them to be able to find yeah. where you are. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But, I, you know, I've had experiences where where you remote view something alien, you get alien activity and then you have just a kind of a negative experience later on that night right? Because they are able to locate you in time and space and, you know, and, and show up. I mean, when you get to the highly psychic uh, beings, even Dogman, like I had to stop remote viewing Dogman. I do not task on Dogman because Dogman tries to sniff out that psychic signature. You don't want that thing like hanging around <laughs> no, your house. No. <laughs> so, I mean, the creepiest stories of Dogman are them opening doors and entering people's homes and stuff. Right. Like, what is that about? <laughs> John and I have probably listened to more and John even more so than I interviews of people that have had encounters with dog man and they are among some of the strangest things. It's a shame that people don't feel like they can talk about this stuff. It's like they talk about it, they get ridiculed and then they just shut up because they right. like never live it down after bringing it up. And gosh, I mean, some of these stories are highly fascinating um they're right. not well, you know, scary they're just seriously. fascinating yeah, you think about it too it's like okay so let's say that for any type of cryptid or ufo whatever um 90 of people don't report what they've seen you only get about 10 percent, maybe like this is hypothetical maybe get about 10 percent of people that report what they see yeah that would literally make all this phenomena way more endemic than you can possibly imagine. Now, the big problem here are the the, the smart cities <laughs> um, where people will live their lives in a city without venturing outside of it into other areas where they can experience this stuff. So it becomes their reality that there is nothing out there. But yeah, you know, really, when it comes down to it, it's probably around 90% of people that never talk about, never report what they well, see. We, we live in a society where you are told to doubt yourself if you see anything like that to begin yeah. with, right? And then also there's some of the strange things that you and I have found or that we've put together is the strange phenomena whereby if people are having a sort of traumatic experience in a certain area, the people in that area will all report the same activity in that area. For instance, if you're on the water, you're hearing voices, you're hearing the same voices and they're from women and they're sirens and they're trying to tell you to go into the water, or all of these different things. Why aren't you hearing that when you're on land? If you're in the woods, why weren't you hearing sirens? Right. Why is that right. only happening in the ocean? Like that doesn't make sense. Like that information doesn't make sense. There's got to be something connected with these things because if you're hearing these voices, they're not coming from nowhere. You're hearing them somewhere. You're just you're just tuned into a frequency and some channel that you weren't tuned into before. And I think your body ends up opening up a lot when it's going through something like some serious experience like that. You know, some of it could be hallucination. But again, our modern science tells us that hallucination is just that it's fake. It's not real, but that's not necessarily true. Right. Whatever you're seeing is happening somewhere, right? It's like your body, your soul and your body are almost detaching from themselves and you're experiencing something in some dimension. Um, and I, yeah, I just think like that's, that's where this stuff gets kind of like really, uh, just confusing, you know? People are really confused about these things. What's that? Oh, yeah. So you guys out there, um, Lindsay just told me, she reminded me to tell you guys that we have a new shop. It's called shopmetaphysical.com, uh, right? Shopmetaphysical.com. And uh, we have a bunch of cool shirts that uh, I designed, yours truly. Um, one is a Skinwalker. We've got Mothman. We've got... Bigfoot shirts and they're really cool shirts. And if you want to support our work, you can, uh, you can buy one of these shirts and, and, uh, and wear it. They're really fun. They come in all different colors, all different sizes. So 
choose what you like over there. And we're going to be adding to the shop as we go. Yeah, speaking of those smart cities you were just talking about, John, where if people are living in smart cities, they might not have encounters. Mothman kind of is the exception there because Mothman's been seen more in right. Chicago than anywhere, isn't he? Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's quite an anomaly. Yeah, that's one of the strangest for sure. The Mothman, the, mo the whole Mothman anomaly. All right, let's see here. Let's get some more questions uh, here from... Um, okay. This is from, oh, you got to stop hitting. That's okay. Oh, I just lost my place. Hold on one sec, guys. Hey, no. Um, okay. So from Chris Grant, John seemed to enjoy the Fatima white lady remote view. Has he heard of Monsignor? 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 Yeah, in the French Pyrenees. It has a famous white lady that is often seen there. Would he be interested in tasking it? Oh, that's interesting. No, I have not heard of that. That's definitely something I'm going to look into and, and task on. Okay. Yeah, I haven't heard of that either. Um, well, I guess what it's, it, it could where be similar the to were? the Fatima sightings, maybe. So this is actually where the Templars were, reportedly. Huh. Yeah, they have the, like a big, big Catholic fortress out there. Mm. Okay. Okay. Um, here's another question from Kelly Crocker. Any knowledge of experiencers becoming vegetarian after contact with beings? I smoked for 30 years and stopped immediately. Okay, I just lost my place again. Okay, thanks. Um Stopped immediately after the encounter. No withdrawals. Became uber conscious of the environment. Yeah, you know, I mean, some people will um, shift their perspective quite a bit when they have contact. It also depends. So one thing that I have um, come to understand over the years is that whatever race people get in contact with, because it, it's way more complicated than people make it to be because they have limited uh, information, limited sight into these things. There are so many different beings that come here and interact with earth. And if mm -hmm. your interaction point is, is, is with a culture who has certain cultural ideals, whether they're extraterrestrial or uh, interdimensional or whatever, they may instill into you telepathically, which actually turns into a huge empathetic response to become vegetarian because we are mm. vegetarian, right? So, so you have to take that into consideration. You know, when you engage with these beings, is <clears throat> what they want you to be the way you should be, being a human at this point in time, because they will have their ideas. Just so you know, right? <clears throat> it's like a, it's like you're tuning into like the vast amount of opinions out there in the universe, right. which are even greater than the amount of beings in the universe. Right. <laughs> right. That's interesting. Oh, here's a pretty interesting question. Um, what's the furthest back John's ever remote viewed in time? And where's the furthest in space you've remote viewed in distance? This is from um, Liz Kesterson. Ke Kesterson. Yeah. I think that probably dinosaurs is my guess. I can't, you know, the hard thing is, is judging time. Yeah. And that's really, you know, time isn't necessarily linear. We perceive it as being that in the human body, human condition, and time is not necessarily that. So, you know, I, 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 as far as that goes, that human construct, it would probably be from this point to that point would be dinosaurs. Maybe. I mean, the, then again, we've looked at um when some asteroid belts were created when the oort cloud was created that's got to be way earlier than dinosaurs so from this point in time um i couldn't tell you i couldn't tell you how long long ago we viewed things how mm. that time frame but as far as how far out we've gone i don't know i mean i don't know pleiades all Aldebaran. Um, yeah, you've been to Vega before, right? You've Vega. I think Vega is closer. Epsilon Aridani is closer. Yeah, Vega is closer, isn't it? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, like what we'll do sometimes is we'll we'll task on a star system and we'll do an open search for uh, planets, habitable planets and any potential life and describe that. So we'll, we'll do that at times. And mm -hmm. that takes us really far away. But see, again, it's limited by what our telescopes have seen. You know, now what would actually be interesting is to 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 take that application and apply it to um, uh, some of the Hubble images of galaxies, right. distant galaxies. You know, that might be interesting. Like the galaxies that, that are that just have names that are a series of numbers. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, so uh, just if anybody had a question as to why this is, John, why is your why are your searches limited by what telescopes have seen? Oh, right. Because with remote viewing tasking, we typically need a solid to task upon, right? We typically need something either material referenced, right? Or somebody's experience, and then we can task around that. Um, so yeah, that's why. That's why actually tasking on a photograph or basis, uh, the basis of on some astronomical information works re really well. Mm. Cool. Here's it. Here's a cool one from Millsy17. They asked, has John ever remote viewed the 12,000 year disaster cycle when the earth tilts over? Yeah. 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 Have done that. Um, let's see. We've looked at, okay, so when we get back pre, like 12,000 years from now, we get into the younger Dryas time frame mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to see, you know, what caused the younger Dryas. And all that data came back with uh, activity from our sun. So activity from our sun, which caused uh, like just a major explosion from the sun, whether that's a CME or just plasma, right? Something happened to the sun where it blasted out, which scorched the earth to a degree. And then within that debris or plasma, whatever dust coming from the sun, we get rocks that are hitting the earth as well. So, so the disaster cycle, that 12,000 year disaster cycle seems to follow um, that sort of idea, that sort of thing. And interestingly enough, you know, when you look into um, some of the science around it, and it's, it's really like fringe science, according to the mainstream, but anything different than the mainstream is fringe science or pseudoscience. Um, there is the idea of a galactic sheet coming from, it's not really an idea, it's actually science, in science peer-reviewed papers, galactic sheet that moves from the center of the universe through the solar systems. And you can look at Suspicious Observer's YouTube channel for information on that, but our data correlates with that type of event overall that causes the disaster cycle. Yeah, that is a really, the whole thing of the 12,000, it's really interesting, especially when you start looking into different um, objects that are on the planet that seem to allude to this type of thing or this right. these periods of time as well. Um, like the mathematics around the pyramid, I believe, um, is on a 24,000 year cycle, which is called like a, uh, it's a, called like a, it's like a galactic year or something. I don't know. I can't remember right. the exact name for it, but that's two 12,000 year cycles that the mathematics around the pyramid and like what it lines up with, you know, you're talking about a period of time that's much greater than, than what a human being living on this planet would be used to. Right. Why even do that? I mean, you know, like that just brings up a whole rabbit hole of questions that you have. Yeah, to like why does that with. happen? Yeah, yeah. And right. why did they build them that way to tell us right. what? Right. How did they know that? You know. Right. right. Very interesting. Yeah. Totally. I mean, you know, like you get to Dendera, you get to some of these other underground locations. Mm -hmm. um, in, in remote viewing those, we see that those were built preceding a disaster because they knew a disaster was coming. Right. To, it's time to go underground because this thing is happening probably again and again. And also when you get into the, the, um, the yugas, the idea of the yugas, 
the yugas follow like the overall cycle is is broken up into 24,000 years, 12,000 years and then within that are smaller cycles. And and some people have correlated uh within the smaller cycles disasters happening that mm. causes a turnover or reset again again. So geological disasters happen along these lines as some form of reset here on earth and then you get into the suspicious observer's side and he documents a peer reviewed paper that upholds the idea of this universe wide galactic event that moves through the solar systems that cause that potentially cause these things. Mm. Right. So very interesting. Yeah, it is. Cause he brings the science behind it. Mm. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay. So I'm just curious if you, I've never heard of this before. Someone in our chat was asking about a 774 AD Assyrian monster invasion. Have you ever heard of this? In a, a 774 AD Syrian monster. Assyrian, <laughs> it's a Assyrian oh, monster invasion of 774. Oh, Assyrian, like Assyrian. Assyrian, like, yeah. Like like the the Assyrian people, as correct? Opposed to from Syria, correct? Sources. Okay, yeah, okay. I've never heard of that. That's interesting. I'm going to have to research it. Yeah. Yeah, no, never heard of that. So Steve Byron, uh, Brian was asking that we we have not I've not heard of that either. But that's really I'm going to have to look into that. Stay tuned. Yeah. That's gonna be, that's a weird one. That's that's I'm going to chase that one. Oh, look at here. The cryptids were go pull that back up. The cryptids were involved were apparently wolf like with spines and zero fear. They attacked villages and stole kids. You know, I mean, what's strange about that is all of the record of of werewolves or wolf men or dog men going back as far as history goes back. That's what's so strange about that. I mean, we're not talking like the first historians were talking about wolf men that people right. well, you, re remember that thing you told me to watch that was uh, a short Netflix film on Netflix about the dog men, wolf, <clears throat> wolf men guys being used like in Afghanistan military yes. service. That's what that just reminded me of. Yes. Yeah. So there, so the guys, for those of you that don't know, there's a show on Netflix. I think it's called love sex and robots or something like that. I think it's episode like 15 or 16. There's a short, which is a 15 minute film. That's just about skinwalkers or sorry. What was the name of it? It was called shapeshifters. It's called shapeshifters. <laughs> And it is basically about guys that turn into wolves, like five, like, you know, bipedal wolves and fight for the U.S. government. And then but other countries have these as well. And they get into a fight and what happens, basically. And it was very real feeling, which is what was weird about it. You know, right. if like meaning if if there are cryptids like this, you can imagine the military making use of them and and or is love, death and robots. That's what it is. Love, death and robots. That's better than love, sex, and robots, I guess, right? Um, yeah. So this this is a pretty interesting Netflix series because of the um, it, like every episode is just on a totally different story. They're just like short short films. So definitely check that out. Uh, okay. So here's a pretty interesting question that's just very different. Um, Justine J asked, "What memories and suffering are consumed when we eat?" animals so actually i'll take the first stab at this one and then i really want to hear john what you think about this but if you look in in history all of the traditional cultures tell you to treat your meat by with with fire meaning to cook your food like you're you're meant to cook meat because when you cook meat it it goes it like transforms the substance from one substance into something that's consumable and you're basically eliminating what a lot of what you're talking about this is why people can eat meat and they're not like having adverse effects from it if you were to do some searches for places on the country where they eat the most amount of raw food and you look at what those people are dying from in that country? Like what is the, the the biggest percentage of death rate in that country? You will often find it's of stomach born illnesses as if like the, what you're talking about, this like karma 
is getting stuck in their stomach and then they have no way to process it other than to actually have all kinds of strange diseases come up. This is why you're meant to cook your food. This is my understanding now. You don't have to subscribe to this. This is what I found through my research over a really long period of time. So that's cooking your food is essential if you're going to do that. Sorry, right, go ahead, John. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. <clears throat> I didn't know about that. Um, it's, this is a, like a really, it's a volatile uh, subject matter in general. It can be um, on, on meat eating or not. Um, <clears throat> one of the big issues we have today is the factory farms in that <clears throat> they're, it's just a terrible, horrible, mm. horrible situation. You know, if you're a meat eater, you should be uh, sourcing locally. Um, if you can. Yeah. If you can, right. And, and go that path. Cause there's a difference. Now, if you have the ability to hunt and you're a meat eater and you're able to give gratitude to that being, because here's the basic fact, life needs life to exist. 3d life needs other 3d life to exist. And I'm going to get a bumper sticker that says plants scream too. They do. They do. <laughs> I mean, we, um, we've done so many shows on this now, like right. where we're, we're actually showing that plants scream and that they're aware and that they even telepathically communicate. Right, right. So so eating meat or not eating meat, um, it depends on how, where you get it from, um, how you approach it, how it's it's been processed for you. And that also goes with plants. Just You just have to remember life only survives by taking other life. Right. Just by breathing, you are taking other life. And and that's the nature of the reality that we live in. It's, it's, it's an illusion, though. Hmm. It's yeah. an illusion. Well said. And we're not um, I think I personally totally support anyone deciding to do like live their life however they want to live it. If if like where you're at is you want to cut all of that off because it just works for you, you should experiment with that. You should do that. Um, yeah. it's the only way you kind of find yourself when you start doing things like that and, um, look into these things for yourself. You don't necessarily need to listen to us. Yeah. I, when you're, when you're at the grocery store, feel, feel the food that you buy, feel it with yeah. your, with like your vibration. intuition, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Feel the vibrations of it. Is it good for your body or not? Does your body need this or no? I mean, that's, that's often how I go through the grocery store because mm -hmm. there's, I mean, even organic stuff, you there's so many uh, gray areas with organic foods as well. So you really have to use your intuition these days and guidance on what you're putting into your body. Is it right for you? If it is, then go for it. If it's not, then just don't do it. It goes mm -hmm. with any food type. <laughs> this one does not spark joy. That's funny. Um, okay, here's a here's a it, it, interesting question here. Um, Marcus H asked, did John ever remote view what's under the Sahara desert and what beings are there? I can't say that I have, mm -hmm. um, with that sort of thing, we need to have more of a, um, a good account from somebody, a good story, uh, anomalous photograph, et cetera. Uh, something that happened there in order to see to, as our lead in to, to, to go there and yeah. find it whatever right. it is, if there is something a little bit more solid that you can go on. Otherwise right. you're kind of fishing for anything. You're yeah. Really, that, that never really turns out well with remote viewing. Right. Yeah. Anything. I imagine anything could come up. Yeah. Uh, I mean, shoot, you know, w p people like we've had talks about this in the past on other shows, group consciousness can create a reality that then comes back to affect you. And you think it's something that has existed all by itself forever in perpetuity when it hasn't it was a certain period in time that group consciousness focus created and then took it on on a life of its own that's the nature of reality it's that's the nature of reality we don't see that here living in this very slow uh cause and effect realm slower it's not super slow but slower once you step outside of this cause and effect is pretty instant get a group creating something boom it's there good luck with yeah, that yeah you know this idea that john just talked about just proves that thoughts are matter because if you're, if a group of people, never mind, just one person starts thinking about something, if a group of them think about it, it can actually create things that exist 
it, where we're proving that they exist through remote viewers, then going to try to view it. And that's all they see because people have created this thing over time. That doesn't mean remote viewing is not real. It just means that you have to have, um, my understanding is John, you, you have to have like much more of a solid lead in order to get accurate information on something. Right. right exactly. So, you know, one of the questions that I get a lot is, well, can you, uh, remote, have your remote viewers remote view the Lemurians in Mount Shasta, which is one of those situations. It's like, well, why do you think they're called Lemurians? First of all, they might not be. Right. <laughs> we can like, whether they're there or not, we can create that. And even all the yeah. stuff that we've remote viewed around, like what's in Mount Shasta, like I, I, my, we've not like tested this or looked at it, but my intuition tugs me to the side of humans may have opened that door rather than it being there before humans opened that door. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, for those of you that were interested by what John was just talking about, we have a whole series on Mount Shasta that John and I brought up a couple of times. You really should check out this. The stuff that we found here, I have to say, is some of the what we can probably be most proud of because it's some of the oddest crap we've come across. I mean, we found uh, like we found enough leads and evidence to have John and his team remote view and track down some things that him and I both had no idea about this area. Um, and we were able to find evidence of specific types of beings that were close enough to this Lemurian race or whatever that everybody talks about, where we could remote view that and figure out and go down that story to find out more about what was happening. Right. So if you really want to know what's happening in one of the strangest parts of the United States, I highly recommend you watch every single one of these episodes. You will not be disappointed at all. Oh, and you know, okay, so you remember the um, when when we were talking about the guy that ran the observat the low observatory yes who saw strange stuff on the mountain and yes. then he got his telescope and pointed at the mountain and he saw this sort of like the red light he, and the ritual and the ritual right yeah. so there's this ritual thing okay so this is very very recently this is you know within the last couple months or so uh just early, or last year um i had a friend contact me um did not watch any of these episodes, didn't know we were talking about this kind of stuff. And they relayed to me an experience just recently that they had on the mountain with a group of people where it was really very much a lot like what that guy from the low observatory was talking about. Like it was a ritual, these things, these big light forms came out of the trees. So they're still doing this. Yes. These big light forms came out of the trees in a certain area of Mount Shasta to this group of people who were camping up there. And, and they started like making all this sound. It sounded like elephants galloping and they came around the people and like kind of held all their hands and put them through this like sort of higher vibrational type of ritual. So that was an interesting correlation uh, on the stuff that we viewed from that guy from, you know, the low observatory. Strange. That's real strange. It'd be yeah. really interesting to RV that entire situation and see what was going on. Wow. Hmm. What's that? Oh yeah. We're uh, almost at the end of our hour. I think we'll take maybe one or two more questions and then, um, we'll be, um, we'll be signing off really soon. Before we do, I just wanted to kind of take a minute, tell you about Rise.TV. Uh, this is a way that you can support our work is getting a subscription to Rise.TV. And it's not just like normal uh, Patreon, where you're just kind of like throwing money into a black hole. Like we try to give you guys back as much as we can for your support. We've got like over 400 videos on all kinds of crazy topics there that you can get into that you'll find fascinating. You'll never really run out of stuff to search for and uh, man, we've got so much history and crazy research on there. So definitely check that out. And if you'd like to support our work, definitely um, sign on to Rise.TV. And um, we're going to be putting, John and I are going to be putting a lot more stuff up on YouTube um, this 
year in 2024 and it's there's going to be a like we're going to still do our podcast that's still going to be on spotify and all of that but youtube we're going to really up our game on so keep an eye out for all of the the different types of content we're going to be putting out on youtube all right so um a couple of questions before we sign off here lots of people were asking about lake volstock and what's under lake volstock would you like to Bok -tok. lake bok -tok. um that is we gosh i remember a long time ago we were looking at that um and if i remember this has got i'm looking at it like in the 1990s because it was sort of like more in people's consciousness back then right um i think that on the one side there's like this um ecosystem down there that's very much unlike anything that we've seen uh, under the ice. And I do believe with remote viewing data, it pretty much went as far as that. Mm. In other words, like there's, there's nothing that is alien or ancient civilization in that area. It was literally that there was this lake under the ice with, with life forms that were strange because they evolved down there um, and not on the surface. Hmm. I do believe that was the case on that data. Hmm. So just very strange beings that we would not recognize, almost that they went down a different track or they're more Jurassic than anything that we have. Yeah, yeah. completely protected under the ice for a long time. Hmm. That's really weird. I, I, yeah. I'd love to know what would be found under there. You know, how big is Lake Vo Vostok too? Is it like, is it massive or is it, you know, just. I think it's pretty large down there. And I think there was the idea of hopefully eventually getting people down there or a submersible down there to really explore it. I don't know what they've done lately. I used to watch that information quite a bit, but I, I don't know what's going on with it. Well, and they wouldn't tell us because if too many, yeah. too many animals were found down there that didn't match anything that it just opens up too many too many questions. I think they would do that very secretive if they did it. I'm sure they have done it, actually. They just haven't told us. Yeah. All right. So let's see here. One more question we'll get into. Um, trying to find like a really juicy one here. Okay. Okay. Actually, why don't we end on? <clears throat> okay. Here's actually here's an interesting one. So is is this is from Baked Beans? <laughs> That's their name. Is Bigfoot part of a DNA project like humans? So they're assuming. Oh, yeah. That's interesting. Um, probably. Um, we had looked at like the origination point the creation point of giants mm. like we've done with humans and whatnot and what we saw with giants was that it was a genetic manipulation um by a different race of beings like like all this stuff is i mean i people will be shocked at the genetic manipulation that goes on everything these days is it, it just seems that way like stuff that we come across even animals here on earth. So I, I would not doubt for a second that Bigfoot is that, but you know, it's one of those things that, well, we should verify with remote viewing, look into it, look at the origination point. Giants are that way. Humans are that way. Many animals are that way. You know? So yeah, good question. That is a good question. All right, you guys. Well, um, I hope you guys enjoyed this, uh, live episode. I love doing these because we get to talk about so many different types of things. Um, and yeah, you guys, leave your comments below. Let us know what you think. Let us know more about what you'd like to talk uh, or have questions about. We're going to be doing more of these live shows, um, you know, in the near future sometime. So we'll get to it uh, then. And um, yeah, John, thanks so much for being yeah. here. All right. And for everybody at home, we hope you guys thought this episode was as out of this world as we did.